Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. Also, on September 27th, I'm hosting a free Zoom history conference all about the 1915 Edmonton flood, the worst flood in Edmonton's history. Today on the podcast, I'm talking to Jean Taillé, who is a descendant of Louis Riel, an Indigenous rights lawyer, and also the author of an excellent book called The Northwest is Our Mother, which is about the Métis Nation. I had a chance to read this book, and it's fantastic. And I was really happy to be able to talk to Jean about her book, about her ancestor, and about the Indigenous and Métis in Canada. So why don't we just get straight to that? And, um, so I guess many people don't realize, but you're the great-grandniece of Louis Riel, right? That's right. And so how has his legend and his story kind of impacted your own life? Well, um, well, I grew up with a very, very strong sense of being a real. I was raised to be very, very proud of that. Now, so I'm in my 60s now, so that was in the 50s, and that was not a time when uh, most people thought that Riel was uh, an admirable man and uh, it was also not a time when anyone um, uh, when there was any benefit or any uh, much pride attached to standing up and saying you were Métis it was a time when the Métis were everything that you could every epithet you could think of was wrong if you were you were a dirty drunken stupid Indian is what they would call you mm -hmm. and if you were a real it was worse because you were a traitor you had that sort of brand of the mm -hmm. T on your head and um, being a, labeled as a traitor is the thought to be the, the most heinous crime in our um, system in the sort of British law system one could question that you know <laughs> why is it a higher crime to um, want to change the state, which is what Louis Riel was doing, um, at, than it is murder, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you have to look at the different definitions of treason for the last few hundred years. At one point, it was treason to uh, seduce the king's daughter. That was from <laughs> Louis Riel. That was from Henry VIII's time when he was worried about his daughter Mary and, and Cromwell. Right, so though, and it was also treason to counterfeit coins. So mm -hmm. our definition of treason has changed somewhat, and it's always been a very political activity. So I grew up with a lot of this discussion. My family was very, very political, and the the, the talk when I from the time I was a baby was all, a lot of Métis politics, Catholic politics. French politics and Canadian politics all muddled together in a way that a young child didn't separate mm -hmm. um, easily. And I didn't actually sort out all those tangled threads for many, many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I did, I thought that you were, you were Catholic and Métis and, um, and, and I didn't know that you had choices about these things. <laughs> you know, that, you know, that, you know, just didn't occur to me for a long, mm -hmm. long time. So, so that's sort of the milieu I grew up in was a, um, a situation where, where um, being a real was an important component of our childhood and our life. Um, kind of in relation to something you did mention, uh, Louis Riel's image has changed quite a bit over the past, even just the past couple decades. Uh, he's seen as the father of Manitoba, and he's moving away from, like you said, that uh, that view as a, as a traitor to more of almost a, a folk hero and somebody who had a, a large impact on Canada and in a positive way, uh, the least of which is bringing in Manitoba into Confederation. So how, is it, how have you seen this image change over the years? Oh, hugely. The, um, now, I, I don't, I think it would have been, no, okay, so it was one of the RCMP um, 
birthdays. Um, and I can't remember which one it was or how that all worked, but it was, um, they published a little book, right? About, you know, celebrating the RCMP. And one of the great pieces they have in that is that Louis Riel wanted to start his own country and the RCMP <laughs> went in and put him down. And I, I remember thinking, let's go, what? I mean, first of all, it's nonsense. It's yep. at historically crazy. But the fact that the RCMP still, and this is only a few years ago, you know, I'm trying to remember, but I think it's in the 90s, 1990s, the, that this thing came out. Um, I should really go look that up. <laughs> but it, um, uh, it, it, it shows you how recently it is that people, uh, that our major police force uh, thought that way. I would, get, I would venture to guess that many of them still do think mm -hmm. that way. Um, I think Canadians are very poorly educated about our history for the most part. Um, everybody knows Louis Riel as a name, but they know very little about him and they know almost nothing about his people. Mm -hmm. uh, and they appropriate him. So that's one of the ways he's changed, right? It, it's To my mind, it's the idea of when a real historical character moves almost into the realm of Jungian myth, right? Mm -hmm. Is when people can make that character be anything they want, right? And they do, right? Mm -hmm. So the people in Quebec revere Riel, but they revere him as a Francophone Catholic. Leader. Nowadays, not so much the Catholic part, but the Francophone mm -hmm. leader. They have no concept of the Metsi part of it, right? It's all about the about him being a Francophone leader. The I'm told. I'm, I have no idea, this may be not true, but I keep hearing it from various people. I should actually contact Preston Manning and ask him if it's true. <laughs> but I hear that he has a picture of Louis Riel in his office, or he did. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a painting or something of Riel stepping on the surveyor's chain. And for him, Riel was the, voice of Western, the first voice of Western alienation. Mm -hmm. So now talk about, um, you know, different takes on on this man who is the the mates he inevitably when i in, when i interview uh elders call him a saint they say mm -hmm. oh he was a saint that's almost always their first year oh he was a saint so for them there's this spiritual um connection to this man he was not just a political leader for them he was a spiritual leader as well so there's all of these conflicting ideas people see him as a martyr people see him as a traitor people see him as a hero people see him as the great man people see him as the one man to blame <laughs> like he goes he, he he rides the spectrum and to me that's where you move into myth right you mm -hmm. move into the realm of uh, away from historical fact entirely yeah. and he becomes and the minute somebody takes on that mythic role it really shows you, I think, how larger than life they must have been in their lives mm -hmm. in order to have moved into that realm. And, and I think that's pretty clear in the historical record that he was a huge personality and everybody saw... And he was only 25 yes. in the events of the Red River Resistance, right? We still call those kids. Yeah. We call them youth. <laughs> and, yeah. and he's I tiny. You know, sometimes I think of him as like the, the, uh, the kid, today he'd be like the little hacker kid who's sitting mm -hmm. in his basement and manages to stop China and the United States and Russia from doing what they're wanting to do. And that's exactly what he did. Now, he didn't do it with a computer and hacking, but he stopped the, the Great Britain and Canada from trans making the world's largest peaceful land transfer that's ever happened mm -hmm. in the world. And he stopped one... 24 year old kid <laughs> in Red River. That's yep. astonishing, right? What mm -hmm. he did. So mm, that, he must have been amazing. I, if I could go back and, <laughs> and meet one person, I think it might be him. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of, you also mentioned it. Um, I've done a couple episodes, not on the uh, the resistance and everything specifically, but on uh, like Big Bear and Poundmaker. And in oh. writing about or doing the episodes on those, I, I'll come across kind of people who say like, 
Canada's civil war and things like that. And generally they're called like, the, like you said, the 1870 rebellion and the 1885 uh, rebellion. But is that kind of an oversimplification of those events? And is it yeah. even like miswording them? Because like you said, he wasn't trying to make his own country. He was trying to get rights for his people within the country or like, I mean, Manitoba is from that. So is it an oversimplification and miswording to call these things rebellions or especially a civil war? I, I think it's, I would never go so far as to call it a civil war. You certainly okay. can't use that um, on in 1869-70 because uh, north, the northwestern part of Canada from Ontario West was not part of Canada. So you That's can't a have point. a civil <laughs> war with a different country. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So a, and that's also why it's not a rebellion. You can't mm -hmm. rebel against some uh, somebody else's monarch, right, or somebody else's country. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, but those are real technicalities, right, on the on the term. But really, what it is is the there's oversimplification in a lot of ways for those. So number one, he was trying to negotiate Manitoba and the Northwest into Confederation. He wasn't trying to rebel against. It. The only difference is that he wanted to negotiate terms. And, you, you know, you got to remember, Canada was, in 1869, two years old, right? Mm -hmm. Two years old. They, they had just gone through massive negotiations to create Canada two years before. And Nova Scotia was one of the big, um, uh, what now a province, that stood up and demanded terms to negotiate. That's Joseph Howe, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got this, he demanded negoti to negotiate and to have terms, and he held up things to get what he wanted. And But they come to this massive territory. Red River had um, 12,000 people in it in 1870, and somehow McDonald didn't think he had to negotiate, that he could just take it over and the only the only thing, reason he thought that is because they were indigenous mm -hmm. so it's racism at play here so on that sense it's all wrong to call it a rebellion but the other mm -hmm. thing is that with respect to the Cree um, so Poundmaker and Big Bear who they were not working together the the Cree and the Métis now, it's true that the Métis were trying to get them to work together. Mm -hmm. So Dumont spent a lot of time traveling back and forth to meet with people, to chiefs, and, and uh, talk to them. And there are letters back and forth where we are certainly trying to get them on side. But, event, but, but the events really overtook any sort of political moves to work together. And it really ends up being that the Cree are on their own path pursuing their own objections, which have nothing to do with what the Métis are fighting about. So in that, I'm talking about 1885 yeah, now. Yeah. So they're, they're both engaged in what we collectively call the Northwest resistance, uh, but they're really not even, they, they're not even really talking to each other. They don't know what's going on with each other. There's no coordination here, and they don't even have the same objectives. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just it's almost like a coincidence that they happen at the same time. Yeah. It could have happened in entirely different time frames. So I don't think of it as a civil war on behalf of the Cree, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, what you have is on the part of the Cree, you have a resistance to absolute brutality on the part of the Canadian state. The Canadian state was poisoning them and starving them and locking them up in what in every way is a concentration camp in some of those situations. If you lock people onto a place where there's no food, no potable water, they, and, they, and you use the Northwest Mounted Police to surround the mm -hmm. reserve and tell them they can't leave, that's a concentration camp, right? Oh, and, and they only got food if they worked. Now, we know what the sign over the top of Auschwitz says, uh, Arbeit mag free, right? Work mm -hmm. makes free. That's exactly what we did. We didn't have a sign, but that's exactly what we did to the Cree. So they were fighting for food. Yeah. They were fighting for decent conditions. That's a very different thing from what the Métis were fighting for. 
the Métis were actually feeding them mm -hmm. when they could. Um, we have a letter from Gabriel Dumont where he's complaining to the government and saying, you, it's disgraceful what you're doing. And then you're turning on us because we're feeding our cousins. What are you talking about here? Um, so we know that that's happening there. But what the Métis are fighting about is land. Yeah. Um, they're not starving. They're not in this, they're not being corralled and kept in, uh, you know, the, essentially a concentration camp. They're not being brutalized as the, um, as the Cree are. So yeah. they're fighting for a different thing. So I think I use the word Northwest resistance as a sort of a broad overview to refer to the events that are happening in Saskatchewan in 1885, 1884, 1885. Yeah. And then Canada's brutal response to it, which is basically to hang them and to mm -hmm. throw them all in prison, which yeah. is, which is, you know, the act of, I would say, uh, dictators almost, you know, the kind of, that kind of totalitarianism, which is you shut up and take the poisonous food and you live on that place where all your children and your women and your elders are dying because mm -hmm. there's no drink, drinkable water and there's nothing and we won't let you leave. But you, and if you dare, to attack, and there was food, right? That's the worst part of this. There was, it's not that there wasn't food. They locked it up in storehouses and wouldn't give it to the people. So when the young men actually break in and steal it, that's what they get hanged for. Like, yeah. This is, in, how do we call this a rebellion? Um, only in the sense that you've got elites far away who have some idea that you shouldn't dare to criticize our... <laughs> Yeah, programs and things. You know, it's there's in every way. I think the Métis and the Cree were right mm -hmm. about what they were fighting for. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually when you bring up Joseph Howe uh, and Nova Scotia. I mean, it, it kind of shows that that difference where they actually have an anti-confederation party, almost kind of running <laughs> things. And Joseph Howe, uh, you know, I think at first he was very against Confederation and then he switches sides and he's very in favor of it and he gets rewarded for it. But you never hear any treason talk with Nova Scotia and these people who had a party that was literally their whole goal was not to be in Canada. But then uh, the Indigenous and, and the Métis and everybody, they're the ones who are, like you said, uh, they're the ones who are tried for treason and, uh, you know, the largest mass hanging in Canadian history uh, after the uh, 1885. Mm -hmm. It shows a very big difference. So it's a, it's a nice parallel to kind of show the, yeah. it's okay for Nova Scotia, but it's not okay for the Métis kind of thing. And it's okay for Newfoundland to say no. Yeah, exactly. Right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> Nobody went in and, and uh, sent, you know, built ships and sent the army in on them. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so uh, with the book, uh, one thing I really loved was um, one of my favorite places in the world is Fort Edmonton Park. And uh, not for the past mm -hmm. two years, because they've been doing renovations, but they would always have voyage, uh, voyageurs coming in on a certain day. Usually I think it was harvest day. And I never really thought about it then, but they were singing when they came in. And so when I was reading your book, one of the things that I loved was you think of the voyageurs as, you know, they're all, all these rough and tumble guys and they're, they're hardy, but some of them are being recruited because they're good singers. And like, was that a really good job skill to have because those long trips, having somebody who could sing really well, just made it that much easier kind of thing. It was, and, um, and my husband's a musician. <laughs> he plays in the band Chilliwack, and they, you know, oh, so really? they, you know, he's a rock and roll. Yeah, so oh. uh, it's the, kind of the family band. <laughs> uh, <That is> awesome. <laughs> so they, um, and when I, I remember when I was found that fact, and I came downstairs, I must, I must have come. I, I read up in a little <laughs> attic up in my room, and uh, I, I must have come down a hundred times while I was writing the book, going. Did you know? <laughs> and I even in an early draft, I even had little boxes in the the book that were sort of did you know that little factoids? Because I was so fascinated. My editor didn't like them very much, <laughs> but but I, I, I liked it. them. And yeah. and one of the ones I came down with was to my husband saying, "Did you know that voyagers got paid more if they could sing well?" <laughs> And he was just blown away by that. He thought that was just the, the best thing. But it's true. Mm -hmm. And really what it shows you is how the 
the Norwesters. So this is not the Hudson Bay Company, right? The yeah. Norwesters, the Northwest Company, that they knew how important music was um, to, you know, music was just as important as food in a lot of ways, right? Because food doesn't really change your mood if it's raining, you know, okay, you're going to chew on that pemmican and everything, but singing can mm -hmm. get you through. And so the idea that you, if, you know, you've got three voyagers standing there who all want a job and you've only got jobs for two, if one of them sings really well and you know that, you can pick him, mm -hmm. right? And pay him more for that. And I thought that was just extraordinary. I also love the fact that they cleaned up before they landed. So, you know, mm -hmm. your, your image is talking yeah. about, about them coming yeah. scruffy into port. That's not what happened, evidently. They would all, um, if they had a clean shirt or something like that, or put the beads on or their, yeah. you know, put their feathers out and, you know, tidy themselves up and maybe go for a swim or something like that if it was a hot sunny day so that they all looked very nice and mm -hmm. they would come with the voyager canoes coming in like really 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 fast singing and they would bang on their 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 canoe paddles on the gunnels like dum, 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 <laughs> making noise so then people would from far away on the lake or the river and then people would come down to the shore, right? Because they would know they're coming when they're singing. Must have been just spectacular. Just a thing to it. see, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it was such a cool thing to learn. Uh, and you kind of mentioned it with Hudson's Bay Company, but the settlers coming in with Selkirk. And one really interesting thing in the book was, you know, they come in and kind of start putting these rules in place and, you know, deciding things for the Métis and, the, and all the indigenous who live there. And... I mean, you mentioned in your book, but I guess kind of explain how, how did that go over with these essentially foreigners coming into their part of the country and saying, you know, this is how you're going to live now. How did the Métis and everybody kind of respond to, to these new rules that were trying to be put over them? Well, it kind of went down like a lead balloon. You know? <laughs> I mean, if you, can you, you just have to kind of imagine what it was like for them in, in there, you know, so mm -hmm. you've got the, Basically, the, so that's the uh, Ojibwe living there, right? So um, Chief Pegasus and his people are, are essentially the resident Ojibwe who are living in Red River area. And then I should just clarify that Red River is not just what we call Winnipeg today. It mm -hmm. was a whole area of southern Manitoba as far west as you know, Capel, at least, into um, Saskatchewan and also down into what we would now call North Dakota and Minnesota. So it was all the areas, they, they thought of the Red River, which flows north from, um, just north of Minneapolis, up into the forks at Winnipeg. Um, then, and then uh, the, the uh, Assiniboine River, which flows from Saskatchewan in, and they meet, and then they go up to Lake Winnipeg. Um, though the, the Métis and the Cree and the Ojibwe all thought of that as one river. So they called it the upper red and the lower red. And so when we talk about Red River, we're talking about that whole area. So in that area, the predominant Cree, uh, our Ojibwe band was the Chief Pegasus and his band. And then you had Métis people there. So they've got a life set out, right? And yes, there's a fort there. There's a Hudson Bay Company fort and there's a Norwester fort for sure. And so you've got them there but they're just traders right and you gotta yeah. pe people overestimate the influence of the traders before just just remember you're on the vast plains you're living your life out on the plains you're fishing you're hunting you're you know gathering together you're having social you know and every once in a while you go to the fort and trade for tea or sugar or coffee or whatever you can get i don't know if they mm -hmm. had coffee but tea and sugar and uh, maybe some flour and maybe some cloth and maybe some beads and everything, you know, and then you go off on your life for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. You don't spend, some people it's true did become sort of what they called home guard people, but that's not the vast majority. So you've got your life with your own sort of way of living. Uh, you're following the herds of buffalo, you are fishing in the right seasons, you're getting your berries where you get it here. You set up your camps where it's convenient and you know you're not going to get flooded out. And you, know, mm -hmm. you, know it's <laughs> um, you know, all of those kinds of things. You've got a life cycle that everybody's living. And then all of a sudden, just one day, these people arrive. And 
they're the straggly ragtag group, right? They've <laughs> yeah. had a horrible voyage over. They've lost people. It got practically a madman megalomaniac who's in charge who doesn't know what he's doing and mm -hmm. he's a complete idiot and 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 an evidently a hedonistic like it was just awful so he's in charge and you got these mostly highlanders but you know there's some irish and a few glaswegians and people like that in there mm -hmm. in there they, they're they're scruffly scraggly they haven't got a clue about anything they arrive in august okay so you just think about Winnipeg. That means they're going to be there that first year with no opportunity to plant because you get a first frost usually by the end of August or the beginning mm -hmm. of September in Winnipeg. So no opportunity to plant. They've spent this year before up in what um, York factory. So they're not, it, they're, they're in no condition to lay down rules, right? Mm -hmm. To walk in and claim that they own everything and that they get to tell everybody who's been there, some of them the Ojibwe for a thousand years, that they <laughs> suddenly, if you, I, if you can even imagine what that must have been like, I can't even imagine that <laughs> ceremony, they had a little ceremony where he plants mm -hmm. the flag and then they have these, I, can't, I, I just imagine the Cree and Métis just standing there shaking their heads. <laughs> Just nuts. Absolutely. <laughs> and, that, and then they started trying to impose their laws, right? They, we've got laws, and I can just imagine the Ojibwe going, what's a law? Like, what are you talking about? Like, what, what does that mean? They, it yeah. isn't that they didn't have rules, but they didn't call them that, and they don't know what the language is. And mm. this idea that you can tell, you can come into my territory and tell me that I can't cut down a tree, or you're going to try and tell me that I can't fish here, and yeah. you're going to try and tell me that I can't hunt buffalo? Like, where do you get off doing that? And they can't enforce it, mm -hmm. you know? So, it's, so it's, it's even stupid. It's not just arrogant beyond <laughs> belief. It's stupid, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> like, uh, I don't know. I, it, 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 when you start to look at things, instead of buying into the great Selkirk settler story, we arrived and we, we yeah. suffered and we you know, you, you buy into that, all of which is true, right? They, they mm -hmm. did. The ones who survived, kudos to them. It wasn't easy, right? <laughs> most of them left. Yeah. Well, that's true, though. Most of them left because anywhere was better than there, mm -hmm. right? So they left. But, um, but the ones who survived, it's a, great, it's a nice survival story. It's great. It's the law part of it that drives me crazy, right? This idea <laughs> yeah. that you need this. Um, and I think the, the you know, the Métis and the, and the Ojibwe didn't take kindly to it at all. With the, mm -hmm. uh, I think the Ojibwe were um, nicer about it. The Métis mm -hmm. tended to just go, <laughs> what? <laughs> and, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> and the Ojibwe were, you know, maybe more in, more diplomatic, shall we say. Yes. And the Métis have never been, been great diplomats. We're too loud and rude <laughs> and um, opinionated and too ready to tell people that you don't stuff it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, in regards to the book, what kind of got you interested in writing the book and, and what's your, what's your goal with it for people uh, reading the book? Well, it wasn't my idea to write it. Um, I'm a, a lawyer and a treaty negotiator and uh, I'm, a, I'm a litigator. I, you know, I, I've been doing that for the last, you know, almost 30 years. And, um, and I have written one other book, which is a Métis Law in Canada, but I didn't actually, that kind of grew over the years. I didn't sit down to write a whole book. But what happened here is Harper Collins came to me and mm. they said that they wanted to write a history of the Métis Nation. And that's because one of their editors is from Saskatchewan, um, grew up in Saskatchewan and she, Iris Tuplin, and she had this idea. And so the man who eventually became my editor, Patrick Korean, said, okay, well, I'll find an author. So I gather he went to talk to about six different people and five of them told him he should talk to me. <laughs> so, so he came to me and it was one of those um, absolute impulsive spur of the moment. I, he said, you know, did I want to write the book? And I just said, yes. I've never written, never written a book before. 
um, like that, or at least never consciously sat down to write one. Be like as I said, Métis Law in Canada kind of grew like topsy over the years, and then we collected it all. Mm -hmm. But um, but to sit down and write this, so in, so in many ways, I didn't really know what I was doing, and I think it took me um, a fair amount of extra time to write because I had to stumble around for a way to mm -hmm. do this. Um, but uh, what I wanted and what what they asked me to do was to write a popular history. And to be honest with you, I had to go look that up. Mm -hmm. I had to sort of go, to, what, is, what does popular history mean? And I invite you to do that. Go look <laughs> it up. Um, and, and it's kind of funny because essentially there is no definition of a popular history. It, it appears to be simply somebody who's written a history where you don't use a lot of jargon. Mm -hmm. It's not an academic attempt and you don't do too many footnotes so that, you know, you're not doing the kind of thing you see in an academic journal where sometimes there's three sentences and the rest of the page is all footnotes. Yeah. Um, so you're trying to make the, it a story that's accessible to everybody. And so I did that. I, that's what I tried to do. I was not writing for the Métis. I was writing for the general Canadian public to tell because the Métis all know this story, right? I mean, granted, this is maybe other than the book my grandfather worked on and that was published in 1935. This is the only other one, I think. Other, now, Fred Shore, Dr. Fred Shore, has just written one as well, but it's more of an academic. He's a historian um, and a university professor, and it's an academic, more of an academic book. But so the idea of writing a popular history of this, this is as I said, after the 1935 one, the first. What impact do you feel the Métis had on the history of Canada? And kind of what would Canada look like without that Métis influence uh, being there, especially obviously in, uh, in Western Canada? Hmm. Well, I think that, well, I, I'm not sure that there are Métis in Eastern Canada. I mean, it depends on how you use the word. Mm -hmm. If you're using it just to designate people who have mixed ancestry, then yes, there's, then uh, yes, there's Métis all over. But if you're using it in terms of um, a culture and a people with their own language and everything, which is the Métis nation and that's the story I'm telling, that only really exists in Western Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that for Western, from, for Western Canada, it's a huge part of Canadian history. And it's also the, it had huge impacts on the development of this country. And it continues to have huge impacts on the development of this country. So I think the Métis have played a crucial role um, in, in our history. And I think they probably will continue to do so. And part of that is, again, because as I said in the book, the Métis nation has always been an intensely political creature. They are not just a nice little culture that has its own little dances and food. I, I don't mean to put down any other culture, yeah. but some cultures are more, more politically engaged and um, uh, than others. And the Métis Nation is one of those political, just like every fiber of their being is political. And by political, I mean that they get engaged in the power basis of the country and they have never accepted this idea that there's a hierarchy in this country, this idea that there are elites up there who can mm -hmm. look down their noses on them and decide things without the nation. We have never accepted that from day one. None of the leaders have accepted that um, and they continue to fight that. And so it's an egalitarian kind of push always mm -hmm. from them. And so in the sense that Canada still needs that, it's not any longer a class structure where you have these elites who are, you know, we don't call them lords here, but, well, we used to, you know, yeah. still came from Britain and wanted to impose that. Now it's money, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's about how rich you are. Are you the Jeff Bezos of the world or something like that? And those are, those are the elites now in North America, the ones who are rich. And the Métis Nation is still pushing back against that. It's still pushing for um, an egalitarian concept of the world. So I don't think that's going to go away because it, 
gets passed down from generation to generation to generation that that is the goal mm -hmm. of a political a polity and that is not the way Canada works mm -hmm. and so we are um, I, I suspect we will in the future play as big a role as we have in the past and we have played a huge role oh, and no, no. it's not going anywhere you know mm -hmm. until we get a truly egalitarian society here where we recognize uh, indigenous peoples as political entities in this country. So that would mean revamping the entire structure of our parliament, of our court systems, of our provinces, of our territories. Everything would be looking different. And that's what Louis Riel did, right? When he called his council together, the provisional government of Manitoba, there were Métis, representatives, there were French representatives, there were English representatives, and there were, and Chief um, Prince was there from the Ojibwe, mm -hmm. and they were all given voices there, there was translation, they, you know, Chief Prince had an equal voice there to the Métis, and to the English, and to the French, that's the way they broke it down, although even the English French is a bit of a strange way of looking at it might more accurately be Protestant versus Catholic because that was equally as important as the language. Um, mm. But you're still breaking down into those those groups. And so I think that, and, and we all recognized that they all needed to have a political voice and it all had to be equal. And mm. he made sure that of that. And imagine Canada today, if we had given indigenous peoples representation for their own people in our structures of power we would be a very very different country today and in fact that's what the treaty negotiations are that's what the way the world is or canada is moving down that path and we could have been there 150 years a while ago, ago yeah <laughs> and so I think that's where we're moving the world the, this country is moving that way with a lot of resistance but it is it is that's the trend and mm -hmm. i think that's where it's going to go and i think all this stuff like black lives matter and all of the the um protests that are going on right now are just a continuation of this egalitarian move so if we move us and he did move those markers forward mm -hmm. um now then there was backlash against that but um what's the the whole change in the way we're looking at him and the whole move now is an understanding that he was right. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, so I think that's where we're going. He was right. Poundmaker was right. Big Bear was right. All of them were right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think Louis, uh, that's why we remember him and that's why he's important. And that's why the Métis Nation is important. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jean Taye. And if you did, please leave a rating and review. You can reach me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history, as well as all of my podcast episodes. Go to canadaehx.com. And again, you can support the podcast by going to Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.